Hello everyone again, Miss Peachy coming back at you from Unit 6, Lesson 3. We are on environmental change of our second semester biology. Um, our keywords here for this lesson are adaptation, evolution, population, reproductive isolation, species, and speciation. So I just wanted to point out that I totally talked about adaptation like in the last lesson before they introduced the term. So you've seen this before. You at least if you watched me, you heard it before, right? So um, let's go on and talk a bit more about these concepts. So again, another thing we kind of talked about in the previous lesson was how the environment is a driving factor. It is a selection pressure. It is something that um, that really kind of pushes change. So organisms are adapted to fit into a particular environment. We, in these videos, have talked about um, biological niches before. And part of that biological niche is the environment. I think of the largest part of that niche is the environment in which an organism lives. And that environment is all of the biotic and abiotic factors that are found in that environment, the ecosystem. That's what the definition actually is, right? And so that it, that includes the temperature, the amount of rainfall, includes amount of sunlight, and includes predators in the in, in ecosystem, um, available food sources, availability of mates, space, diseases, you know, whatever. There's just a ton of things that you can you can take into consideration. Um, organisms have adaptations that enable them to survive and flourish, reproduce in those particular ecosystems. Adaptations, remember, are traits. Importantly, and something I didn't clarify um, in the previous lesson, is these have to be inheritable traits. They have to be traits that can be passed on from parent to offspring, right? So yeah, I can get super fit at the gym, and that might help my survivability if there was a zombie apocalypse, but I can't pass that commitment to working out onto my offsprings. It has to be something that's inheritable. Um, so those adaptations are wonderful and beautiful and help organisms survive and reproduce. But when the environment changes, which it inevitably does because geological time is very long, then what adaptations are beneficial can change as well. Case in point, we talked about as an example in your portfolio, if you have rabbits and you've got brown rabbits and white rabbits, and those are like your two main alleles. I mean, maybe you've got like a dark brown and a medium brown rabbit and a light and a white rabbit, and those are the alleles that you find in that population. Um, if it was, you know, grassy and whatever, there's trees and bushes and, and stuff like that, probably the brown rabbits would be more, have a better advantage. They camouflage better into their environment. If the climate cools and you have more like snowfall and ice as your predominant ecosystem, then the brown isn't as advantageous. The brown rabbits are kind of like standing out on the white snow, right? But if you're the white rabbit, yeah, it's much more advantageous to be white. So we probably see a shift in the frequency of that allele. You'll see more of the white alleles, more of the white phenotype, and less of the brown. So the environment will encourage a shift in I call it, I, I say allele frequency, you could say phenotypic frequency, but in the frequency of that particular adaptation, that trait. Environments change a lot. They change through time. The Earth's history is very long and very tumultuous. And we see lots of different changes throughout, um, throughout the geologic history. Massive changes are things called mass extinctions. These are huge changes that cause lots of organisms to die. So sometimes the change is so catastrophic that organisms cannot survive that change. Those adaptations, they don't have them. They don't have the ability to adapt to this radically new environment. And so they die. And whole species can go extinct, which completely eliminates them altogether, right? 
And so if you look throughout the Earth's history, we have five major mass extinctions that have occurred periodically throughout the Earth's history for various reasons. There's mass extinctions that have been caused by um, kind of changes in climate. We've had mass extinctions due to increase of volcanic activity. We've had mass extinctions due to meteor impact. So it's not just like one thing that causes them. Um, our major ones are the Ordovician mass extinction, the Devonian mass extinction, the Permian, the Cretaceous. Uh, I missed one here. Two, three, oh, Triassic. I missed miss the Triassic one. They didn't have that one highlighted. So we see a bunch of different mass extinctions and why they happened. It said during the Ordovician mass extinction, um, at this time, life was very different on Earth. Um, animals were in the ocean, primarily. And in this case, the, he had a big ice age that lowered sea levels. And um, silicate rock was exposed when sea levels lowered. It was exposed to the air. It reacted with the atmosphere to lower the level of carbon dioxide, which further <laughs> lowered the temperature. Really a huge global cooling event. We call this Ice Age Earth or Snowball Earth, that's called. Um, and as a result, 86% of all species went extinct. There were fewer species at the time. Um, life wasn't as diverse and it wasn't as abundant, but the majority of organisms went extinct. We have the Devonian mass extinction. Um, this is occurred during the Devonian period about 373 million years ago and a hypothesis for this is um, the development of land plants that the plant roots stirred up the soil releasing nutrients into the water which resulted in major algal blooms and the algae sucked out a lot of the water out of the ocean um, and so many ocean dwelling organisms went extinct because the levels of oxygen in the ocean went down. I don't like the verbiage here the algae sucked oxygen out of the water. That's not what happens. Um, algae, this is a process called eutrophication and what happens is the algae actually um, they have a life cycle and when they die they start to decompose and bacteria which are aerobic bacteria need oxygen and they use oxygen um, and there's more of them because there's more food for the bacteria. So the bacteria actually use the oxygen from the water. I feel like they were just trying to oversimplify there a little bit. Around 251 million years ago, we have the largest mass extinction in all of history. And no, it wasn't the dinosaurs. It wasn't the biggest one. It's the most famous, but it wasn't the biggest. The biggest was called the Permian um, mass extinction. It occurred at the end of the Permian period. It actually made way for dinosaurs, believe it or not. So what we see here is 96% of, um, oh, I take that back, the Triassic mass, mass extinction made way for dinosaurs. The Permian mass extinction, 96% um, of all species on earth went extinct. I mean, that's insane, right? 96%. And so what we see here is likely due to volcanic eruption, changing, again, climate. Let's go back. All of these trigger massive environmental changes, right? So there's a theme we're seeing here. And then we see Triassic mass extinction and of course the Cretaceous, which again is the most famous, the big meteor, you know, kills the dinosaurs, 76% of all living things on earth. And um, really made way for the development of mammals. Okay, so I keep saying, made way for stuff. So what you have to realize is during these mass extinction events, what ends up happening is that most things don't make it. It's called a mass extinction for a reason. But those organisms that do are uniquely suited to be able to survive in that particular situation. But before, they had a lot of competition. Now they don't have that competition anymore. So in the absence of the competition, the predation perhaps that they had prior to the extinction event, they have more abundant food sources. They have, they're not getting eaten by predators so they can come out into the open more. Um, there's just multiple reasons why they start to do better. But primarily it's due to the fact that they 
they're lacking competition, right? So because of that, because we've reduced competition, the remaining organisms go on to repopulate the earth and they have the opportunity to diversify. You start to see, you know, that they can reproduce more. And so with more reproduction, you'll get more kind of variation that occurs as a natural byproduct of reproduction. And so you start to see different organisms fill those biological niches that were left vacant during the mass extinction event. Remember, the competitive exclusion principle, which I briefly mentioned before, that um, no two species can fill the same and biological niche at the same time, while the niche is still there, but the species that was there was gone, and so now a new species can fill that niche and can flourish and diversify. And so we see kind of the largest diversification occur after these extinction events, that you see more of something that really was kind of lying in the wings before. So what is kind of false here is that extinction events um, cause other species to just kind of pop out of nowhere. That doesn't happen. We don't just see like an extinction and then like, boom, hey, I'm a flower and I'm gonna be like awesome and populate the whole earth with my flowering plants. It's not like flowers didn't exist prior, right? It's like, it's like they may have been just a rare phenotype, um, just didn't have really the ability to take off and to prosper and to flourish. And the extinction removed the competitive factor that allowed that particular variation to, to really take off and grow. And then once they're well established, you start to see, you know, other things, other parts of natural selection kind of kicking in and genetic drift and, you know, uh, gene flow and all the other things that allow um, evolution to happen. Okay. So lastly, in this um, lesson, there's actually a lot in this lesson, we talk about speciation and isolation. And so we have to first talk about what is a species. So remember, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, right? So species is the most, I hate saying, but the most specific of all the different types of classification. Those that belong to the same species are the most alike each other, right? Um, kingdom is the broadest, so they're the most different. Our domain really comes even before kingdom. Um, so when organisms belong to the same biological species, then they have the ability to mate and produce fertile offspring. That's the biological definition of species. So when we see a species emerge, it is where we see a group of individuals or a group of organisms in the organism that have become different enough from others that might be somewhat similar, that they can only reproduce with each other and produce fertile offspring. So there has to be, there's some differences that make them um, unable to then reproduce with another group. They're different enough. They don't have to be radically different to be this, a different species. Um, let me show you an example of that. Okay, so here's an example of two species of bird. We have the eastern and the western meadowlark. I don't think I'd be able to tell the difference between these two. There's some slight phenotypic differences in body size, in patterns on the um, face and the wings, but honestly, they're, they're very, very similar looking. What really differentiates them is where they live. The eastern meadowlark lives east of the Rocky Mountains and the western meadowlark lives west of the Rocky Mountains. So there's literally like a physical divide that separates the two populations. Because of this physical divide, they don't mate with each other. And so over time, they've changed enough that they just, you know, given the choice, won't mate with each other. Sometimes in birds, what that ends up being is um, their mating call. If their song that they sing, the mating call, isn't the same as 
like the Eastern Meadowlark and the Western Meadowlark sing a different song, they just choose not to mate with each other because, you know, I don't know you, you're singing a different song than I sing, so we're not going to, you know, hook up and produce babies in, at all. Um, so, so that alone, that that behavior and the physical barrier is enough to keep these two from mating. Could they? Probably. Yeah, they can. You know, they can produce, reproduce together if they were like so, like, put in a situation where they had to. But in nature, they wouldn't. So they would fall into the biological definition of being two separate species. So oftentimes people think of different species, like really radically different. Um, but you, I don't want you to think of it that way because species aren't radically different. Species are the difference between a wolf and a, a domestic dog. I mean, that's, that's what we're talking about. It's not the difference between a wolf and a cat they're not even close to the same, right? So the genus is the same, but the species is different. And so really kind of keep that in mind when we're talking about speciation, it isn't, you know, wow, this animal changed into dogs and then cats. It doesn't work like that. It's like you have a wild cat that now have the domestic cat. They're very closely related to one another, very similar, um, but they don't mate with each other and produce fertile offspring. So what ways can they be isolated? As I mentioned, they can be geographically isolated. There can be literally like a physical barrier that keeps them from meeting together. Sometimes these geographical isolations will eventually lead to bigger differences in the population. Over time, they can't mate with each other because they can't, they can't get to each other. And so over many, many, many years, they develop differences due to mutations, due to, you know, just basic stuff that happens in meiosis, you know, that results in variation and the variants are so different that they can't mate. So over many, many, many years, thousands, um, even, you know, thousands and thousands of years, they can physically then not be able to mate. Um, but it can begin with just geographic isolation. We have habitat isolation. They live in the same ecosystem, but they're in completely different habitats. Um, for example, one ecosystem, you have a forested area that surrounds a lake. One population settles in the forest, one population settles around the lake. They have different habitats within that ecosystem, so they just don't ever mingle with one another because they're populating different habitats. Um, behavioral isolation, that's the song. That's the Meadowlark song, they have different behaviors and those behaviors are such that they don't mate because they don't share the same behaviors. Um, they say fireflies have different unique lighting patterns. They flash at different frequencies and different patterns and that determines which fireflies they choose to mate with. So I think those things are kind of cool. Um, temporal isolation, isolation in time. So, for example, you have organisms that are nocturnal. They're active during the day. Oh, my gosh. And we have, we have um, diurnal organisms, and those are organisms that are um, active during the daytime, right? So those that are active at night and active during the daytime, they're not even going to have a chance to mate because they're just not awake at the same time. Um, you've also got other types of a temporal isolation, those that have specific mating seasons, you know, like like white-tailed deer mate in the fall. And, you know, that's when they're fertile. And so that's when mating exists. Um, and so if, you know, one species is mates in the spring and one mates in the fall, then they're not going to you know, be fertile at the same time. And so therefore they won't be able to mate with each other. We have mechanical isolation. They literally have different parts <laughs> and those parts don't work together. So they physically cannot mate with one another because their parts are different. Um, and then we also have something called gametic isolation. And this is where they can mate if they want to, but there's such a difference in their DNA that when they do, they can't produce fertile offspring. They're just way too different for that to happen. And therefore, there's way too many um, errors that will happen. And they don't have the same number of chromosomes. I mean, think about it. <laughs> and so in that situation, you're not going to have a complete organism that's going to develop because that type of isolation prevents it from happening. You're not going to have a dog cat or a dog 
or a or debt or whatever because their gametes wouldn't allow that to happen. So those are the types of isolations. And because of isolation, organisms develop independently, right? And so when isolation starts to happen, then you might have two different groups and those two groups are going to develop independent of one another. Um, I think it's it's a lot, like I feel like with, to, with um, geographic isolation, it's easier example to give but let's think of geographic isolation so you've got this population of birds and you have basically a mountain chain that forms between them they can't get to each other over time the western meadowlark over here they're going to develop variations because of mutations and because of meiosis and stuff like that same thing for the eastern meadowlarks as well. After many, many, many years have passed, the variations kind of add up. And eventually they become so different from one another that they either don't, won't, or can't mate with each other. And that leads to the development of two separate species. That's speciation. That's what it is. People, you know, get really nervous about it, but it really is just that. If you have questions, let me know. Otherwise, guys, that's pretty much the end of this lesson, um, and I will see you all in the next one.